Welcome to my world. <laughs> Are you ready to watch? Because if you want a comic book reviewer who's not afraid to be brutally honest, then so I will be. But are you ready to face the truth and accept my honesty? Because if you are, then I say, good. Welcome to my comic book review for this week of March 2014. I am Blue Goblin. Thank you for joining me. I'm here to review a, a little pile of books that I did not bag and board yet. But I've got plenty of Marvel, some DC, and I got something from IDW. We're going to run through what I call the mainstream and then end with the indies. Alright, we're going to start off with Marvel. We're going to start off with All New X Factor number 4. Yowza! This was really good. Peter David continues to do a good job. I mean, this series, it's still... I feel it's still too early to compare this run to his previous run with Jamie, with uh, with Madrex and the rest of his crew. It's still way too early to compare. But, needless to say, this was pretty good. Uh, at the uh, end of the last issue, we got the big reveal that one of Gambit's henchmen of the in the Thieves Guild, Nil, had not only embezzled millions of dollars from several industries, but has also taken hostage of danger. Yes, good old dangers back in the back on the play. And I loved the stuff we got in here. Fantastic action, good drama. The artwork for the most part it was okay. I just think it could have been a little bit better. The the artwork looked kind of scratchy in some spots, but with what we got in here I was satisfied, but what really sells this is the writing and the storytelling in, in this particular issue. Danger has gone batshit crazy. Her memory has been malfunctioned, her, her memory has been tampered with, not malfunctioned, it's been tampered with. She comes across Gambit and she doesn't remember who he is. She's got one thing on her mind. Kill. She, is go she has got this thirst and this hunger to kill. And... We see some stuff in here from Polaris as well, and I'm like, Woo, Lorna, when'd you get so cold-hearted all of a sudden? You know, there's some stuff going on with Lorna in here that, you know, begs to, begs to bring out some more storytelling just based on her, and I'm ready for that, but for now we got to focus on getting Danger back. And Danger, we see a beautiful display of her her abilities her abilities to create holograms that feel real and that almost that almost are real you know and it's just really really clever stuff i mean she gets one up on everybody on lorna uh i love what she did with polaris uh, that the trick she pulled on polaris was damn awesome she gets one over on Gambit, and she does a good job getting one over on quicksilver just really really good stuff and then we get to the end of the book and here's where my brutal honesty comes in. There's something that Gambit does in here with danger. I'm not going to spoil what he does, but what he does, when I see it, I'm thinking to myself, Bullshit. <laughs> just bullshit. Really? I just, I didn't buy it. I really didn't. I, I can't say anything else because I don't want to give it away, but... <laughs> Who knows? Maybe y'all like this this little this little plot point a lot better than I did. But when I saw it, I just wanted I just I was like, really bullshit. I just I didn't like the ending. I didn't. Um, but it it was a good issue for what it was. Great action, good drama, some interesting character development. Like I said with Polaris, but. <sighs> Like I said, I just didn't like the ending. Moving along to all new X-Men number 24. This is part 5 of The Trial of Jean Grey. 
Oh my bowl. Oh my god. Oh my god. This was good. This was really good. And this is a proper representation on the cover. This really happens. Ugh. In this issue and in this story that is being told, you know, the Shi'ar have been at odds with the X-Men before, but here lately the Shi'ar, you know, have had some sort of mutual respect with the X-Men. You know, you know, even some Shi'ar uh, Shi'ar kids have been at the G have been learning lessons at the Jean Grey School. You know, Gladiator's son has is was once part of the Jean Grey School. But in this issue, it's cleverly painted out that the Shi'ar are acting like the villains of the story, especially Gladiator. And there's a certain someone who steps into the story and even calls Gladi Gladiator out on it. And I'm not going to spoil who that was. Really, really impressive storytelling in here. Stuart Eimann's artwork is fantastic. Bendis is just killing it with the writing. And I even said this on my Twitter page. There's a joke in here. There's a nice little one-liner in here. You know, that Angela takes care of her takes care of business only the way Angela can. And Gamora makes a comment saying, Angela, will you marry me? And she thinks at first it's, Ra it's Ro uh, Rocket. And she goes, no, this is Gamora. And she's like, hmm, okay, then I'll think about it. I'm like, you know what? What the fuck? You know, go for it. If, you know, these, Angela and Gamora already have this very unique friendship. You know, they both share the same lust for a good fight. You know, and I'm like, you know what? Why the fuck not? Have them develop feelings for each other. You know, what the hell? If it, if it flops, then it flops. You know, I'd say, you know, why not? Go for it. Who knows what the hell? Who knows where it'll go to? <laughs> but all joking aside, this was very nicely done. Uh, the stuff that Gene goes through in here is very well, is very well done in here. Uh, a good book for... A good read for any good Cyclops fans out there, but the cliffhanger at the end of the issue was very nicely done, and it's getting me so ready for the conclusion of this story. You have no idea. This has been a phenomenal story. The Trial of Jean Grey has been great. This was no exception. This was a good book. Next up, we got something that I almost didn't get, because... This is probably going to shock a lot of y'all, but the last run for this character just didn't impress me as it did a lot of other as as it did a lot of other readers. Captain Marvel number one, Kelly Sue DeConnick and David Lopez. Thank God we got a much better artist on this title. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, everybody. The last run with Carol. It just, it was good, don't get me wrong, but it just didn't wow me as it probably did y'all out there. You know, I, I don't know, maybe there was something so compelling about it, maybe I just didn't see it. Maybe it was all the god-awful artwork in there that everybody had like these like, like Tetris-shaped like Tetris faces and all that shit. I mean, the artwork for the last run was just horrible. It's just horrible, and the whole thing with Carol losing her memories and trying to remember everything, I was like, eh, I've seen shit like this before. Don't get me wrong. The last run, it was good. I just think it, I just feel like it could have been a lot better for me. But this was a strong start to a new Captain Marvel series for Carol. This was actually really good. I actually dug this. Fantastic stuff. It's good to see Carol actually being Carol again. I have no complaints about this. Kelly Sue kind of did a fantastic job with the writing. Uh, apparently, this is the first time I'm seeing this. It may have happened somewhere else, maybe in an Avengers book, because I don't read Avengers. But uh, apparently, Carol and Rhodey are, are in a relationship, and they have a really big talk in here, and it's really deep, you know, storytelling-wise. It's very well done. You know, Carol wants to go out into space. She, you know... Uh, not explaining why, because she doesn't really know why as of yet. But this is this was a solid read. A solid beginning to a new run for Carol. I've always loved Carol. I always thought 
you know, she had some good runs. I, I loved her stuff as Ms. Marvel and as Captain Marvel. She's doing really good. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, it kind of felt like your standard introductory issue to a new volume, but at the same time, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very well done. There's some good, uh, <laughs> there's a, a fun uh, a fun scene between Carol and Tony in here that I thought was really good. A solid a solid issue. Can't really truly complain. The Superior Spider-Man number twenty nine. This is part three of Goblin Nation. Oh boy, this was good. Dan Slott and Christos Gage did a fantastic job on here. Giuseppe Camoncoli does a great job with the artwork in here. Fantastic artwork. I just wish he was sticking around for the next run of Amazing Spider-Man, but Humberto Ramos is, does good artwork from time to time. This right here is the continuation of Ox Downfall as Spider-Man, and I'm loving it. This is great stuff. Not only do we see the continuation of Ox Downfall, not only do we see a continuation of strong character development for the supporting cast members like Mary Jane and everything like that, but also we are proudly reminded just how much of a badass villain Norman Osborn is as the Green Goblin. This motherfucker really knows how to make shit real and make shit really personal. This guy pulls no punches, he's a true, honest-to-God son of a bitch, and he loves it, and I love it. This was a proud reminder to me that the Green Goblin, regardless of anything else that Marvel tries to spit out there, the Green Goblin will forever be the true arch-nemesis for Spider-Man, right up at the tip-top. Batman has the Joker. Spider-Man has the Green Goblin. And I love it. It's even pointed out in here. He says, Ock, you are always number two. I was always Spider-Man's greatest villain. You robbed me of the pleasure of killing Spider-Man. So basically he's saying, for that I'm going to fuck your life up. And I love this stuff. There's even... I got I to gotta show it off. I got to find it in here. Hang on. There's even a very impressive two-page spread in here that shows off Norman's true villainy. There's a two-page spread in here. This right here is one of the highlights of the whole book. I don't usually like big two-page splash pages like this, but God damn it, this was good. I'm not going to show you every detail. I'm not going to show you the word bubbles. Just when you get this book... Be ready to see the shit on this on this two-page splash. This was really good. Fantastic stuff. Can't say enough of it. One thing I will say, though, is there is a fatality in here. But I'm not going to spoil who, who gets it. But then again, I'm also going to say this. At the end of this story, and at the end of Superior Spider-Man series altogether, I'm praying... That there's another, that there's not another planned fatality to finish off the series. And I'm not going to spoil who I think is going to get it at the end of the series. But all in all, this was a phenomenal read. Fantastic stuff. Spider-Man 2099 does show up near the end of the book, but that's all I'm going to say about that. This was a great read. If you like seeing Ock get his ass handed to him, and if you're a fan of the Green Goblin, you'll love this issue too. Moving on to DC, we got Batgirl number 29. Uh, somebody on Twitter told me that this was, in their words, a goddamn good issue. I believe that's how they put it. And I agree. This was a good issue. Gail Simone does uh, continues to do a great job with this. This is the... Uh, conclusion of the silver storyline in which this guy is going around trying to kill off the members of the bat family because he seriously believes that they're vampires preying on the people of gotham and turning them into bloodless corpses corpses 
and it's just really good stuff. I mean, the action in here was really good. There was plenty of twists in here that I was thinking, hmm, where could this go? Whoop! Okay, that's a, that's a nice twist. I got a lot of that. But there's um, some interesting stuff in here with Strix. The, uh, the talent that Barbara, that Barbara works with. There's a couple of things in here that she does that I'm, I'm not going to ruin it. But all I'm going to say is, damn. <laughs> Just damn. But the, the ending of this issue, holy fucking Christ. What an ending. I did not see that coming at all. I'm like, whoa, really? Ugh. Just damn. That's all. That's all. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Just damn. <laughs> Moving on. Batman number 29. I don't know what's so special about issue 29 that DC just had to make it five dollars. This is really pissing me off, DC, because it's Batman, and my bro, the Mount Vernon kid, will even agree with me on this. DC just loves to ride on Batman's nuts. I swear to God, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. We are not the biggest fans of Batman. Batman's biggest fan base is DC Comics themselves. Nobody has more fan love for Batman than DC Comics. Nobody. I don't give a shit. Nobody. Nobody loves Batman more than DC Comics. I'm not afraid to go there. Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, this was a nicely told book. Was this worth $5? In my opinion, no, not really. This is a $3.99 book at best. I don't know why DC made us pay the extra dollar for this. And there have been some people telling me on Twitter and on Facebook that that they dropped Batman a long time ago because the Zero Year stuff to them is very boring. And I understand that because why bother going back and telling past stories of, you know, Batman's beginnings when, and give us cliffhangers. It's like, oh, he might die. Uh, no, he doesn't because he's around now. So why go back to the past and give us, you know, deadly cliffhangers and stories where we know he's going to pull through. It's just bullshit. And, uh... It, why give us cliffhangers that make us believe that oh somebody might actually off him you know or something like that? It's just ridiculous. But the Riddler is the main focus as the main focus in here. The whole stuff with Doctor Death, I really didn't give much of a shit for it. I really didn't. A, a grotesque figure, and he goes on a ramble about a song called Tokyo Moon. I really, honestly, didn't fucking care. The Riddler was the was the one that got my attention and kept it. I'll say this. It's been a while since I've seen the Riddler look this powerful, you know, as a villain. And it's just it was good for what it was, but I'm not gonna lie, this was not worth five dollars. Because there were so many things in here that I honestly just didn't give a shit. I'll just leave it at that. Average read. A little just a little above average. Just a little above average, but pfft. Way overpriced. Moving on to Green Lantern Corps number 29. Double Cross by the Rogue Lantern. Van Jensen and Bernard Chang. Uh, this was alright. This was actually pretty good. Um, you know, John is going after the, the Rogue Green Lantern. You know, that's hiding out because he's a Durlan or Durlan or whatever the... F or however the fuck you pronounce that, that that's alien species race name, I don't fucking know, but, you know, you think he would side with the Lanterns, and you think at one, and it's, it's made, oh shit, how do I put this, the story makes us believe, I need to rehearse this shit, the story makes us believe he might turn on the Lanterns, then he might join them, then he might turn on them, you don't know what the fuck he's gonna do, there was, there were plenty of flip-flops that would make me think, okay, maybe he's gonna join up with the Lanterns after all, nope, he's gonna double-cross them. And then we get to his, where his true loyalty is, and I'm like, okay, fair enough, we're there. Uh, communications are now back up and fully functional with the rest of the Lanterns. 
and uh, everything seems to be on the up and up. The, the Greenlanders are picking themselves up after they've taken a nasty fall, you know, figuratively. But the cliffhanger at the end of the issue. Uh, shit's getting interesting. I'll say that. And one thing I'll say about the, the Green Lantern Corps is they may not be... Oh, let me see how I can I put this without possibly spoiling it. Let me say that they may not be as united as they think they are. I'll see if I can... I think I'll put it like that. A nice read. Really good issue. I'd say go ahead and give it a look and tell me what you think about that. We're going to end this with IDW's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, issue number 32. Kevin Eastman, fantastic writing. Let me get a look at the, the um, artwork. The artwork is from uh, Ross Campbell. I love Ross Campbell's artwork. I love how he draws the turtles. They each have their own unique look. And I understand that... The artwork is going to change back. Uh, the artwork is probably going to change in the next issue, and I'm fine with that. But this is the conclusion of the uh, Northampton, I believe that's what it's called. Yeah, Northampton. This is part four of Northampton. Uh, Leonardo is uh, seemingly back, and all's well with Leonardo again. At least that's what we're led to believe. We don't know for sure if Leonardo is truly back yet or not. And there hasn't been any, there's not any hints in here as to think that to make us guess what's the state of his mental capacity. We don't know if he's fully back or if he's still a little loopy. We don't get any hints of that at all. And I wouldn't be surprised if we started getting hints of that later on down the line in this series. But for now, everything seems to be doing just fine. Leo's back, the turtles are back together, and everything's kick-ass, cowabunga, fuck yeah. Everything's back to the way it should be. There's some stuff in here that Leonardo does with this with this, uh, this new mutant, who I believe calls himself Koya, a mutant hawk named Koya. And there's something that Leonardo does in here that forces Koya to take a tactical retreat. He has no choice. Now, what, he, what Leonardo does, I'm not going to spoil that because it's really fucking cool. Uh, some good uh, dialogue between Raphael and Alopex. Thought that was really good. I like the relationship that these two are building up. Where could it go to? I don't know. An interesting friendship nonetheless. Uh, but the turtles, unfortunately, are found out. I will give that away. The turtles are found out by April's mother. Not her, fa not her father, but just her mother. But there's some. But April tells her, April and the turtles and Splinter tell April's mother that they have to go back to New York. April's mother accepts it and wishes them all luck. But there's something that April leaves behind for her mother, and the issue ends on a really, really happy ending. Very, very nice. This was good. Just fantastic stuff. I will dare. I will not even dare give away anything of the ending. It was really that good. This has been truly a phenomenal series. Just phenomenal stuff. This is some of the best TMNT storytelling I've, that I've seen in a while. This is really good stuff. If you're not on board with this, you seriously need to. Get the trades. Get the back issues. Do whatever you can. Get on board with this series and just enjoy it for what it is. If you're a Ninja Turtles fan, I promise you, and I've made this promise several times, and I stick to it. If you are a Ninja Turtles fan, I promise you, you will like this series. There's no doubt in my mind that you, that you will like this series. Fantastic stuff. I love it. Well, that's all I got for this review, everybody. I want to thank you all for watching, and I want to thank... Uh, my friends and family at Arkham Comics for supplying me with those books. Thank you very much. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget my Blue Goblin X channel. Don't forget Dark Avenger Inc. Plus as well as Arkham Asylum Studio. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at BlueGoblin01 or you can follow me on my Tumblr page, Tumblr page, <laughs> BlueGoblin.tumblr.com. Also look for me on Pinterest, Blue Goblin Comic Book Review. I'm on Pinterest. 
Don't forget everybody at Dark Avenger Inc. Plus, Mark and Chloe Fast Tech Comics, Deadpoolzilla, Brandon Hex, and as always, my bro, the Mount Vernon Kid. Check out his channels. You won't regret it, I promise you. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and until next time, I'll see y'all later.